You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. Take your Bibles tonight. You're going to go to a book you don't go to very often, but the book of Lamentations. If you go to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, I want to give you a message tonight I've entitled, Oh, so that's why we muzzle the media. That's why we muzzle the media. Now, I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I'm going to give you very little scripture and a whole lot of preaching. Now, I don't often do that. I'll be honest with you. I like to give as much scripture as I possibly can. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a preacher's thing, you know, uh, guys that get up and just kind of go on a rampage and use one verse. We say, oh, not much Bible, but it sure makes good preaching. And so tonight, I'm going to give you one of those messages. Uh, and again, I don't very often do it, but I want to give you this verse that will kind of kick us off. And I'm going to take a little bit to get there, so don't, don't get anxious. But uh, I'll get us there, and then I'll take you through what I want to give you tonight. But I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction because I want to really set the tone for what it is that I'm going to give you tonight. Because I believe of all the things that I've preached to you about up until this point, they're important. And, and I think most of us have an understanding. But tonight, I think this message will really zero in on why we are not what we should be as Christians today. And I think most of us, let's be honest if we look back to other generations of Christianity, how many of you had grandparents that were Christians? Would you raise your hands? All right, most of you. How many of you went to church with a grandpa or a grandma? Grandpa or grandma took you to church. Number of folks, all right? And uh, some of you had good godly parents. How many of you had godly parents growing up? Good, amen, that's awesome. And uh, if you spent any time with those people and listened to them talk about their experiences of church, it doesn't take very long to realize that they had something that we just don't have in this generation. I think you'd agree with me tonight. Would you agree with that? Amen. There was a difference in Christianity a few years ago. I sat down and looked objectively at the Christian life my grandparents lived and that my parents lived and that I now live before I wrote this message. My grandpa and Grandma Stone were great godly people. My Grandma Christy got saved when I did, so she was a, a good person, but she wasn't saved, my Grandma Christy, until she was in her 50s. And so uh, her life after Christ is one that I remember. But my grandpa and Grandma Stone, as, as far as I can remember, were saved as kids and grew up in church. My grandpa was a lay preacher and would preach in just about any church that would have him. He often spoke in brethren churches and Baptist churches and claimed Bethel Baptist Church as their church home. And, and he was a man who knew the Bible. I mean, he had a grasp on the Bible. He was just a guy that, he was just a godly man. You, when you were around him, you could just tell that, that he was a man that loved God, knew God. God, walked with God. And my dad's a good guy. My dad's a good Christian man and, and uh, uh, got saved as a teenager, got away from, or actually got saved as a kid, got away from the Lord as a teenager. And, and uh, we'll share that testimony gladly with you, tell you that when our uh, family started going to church, my sister and I started going back to church, or going to church as kids, I should say, my dad then had a desire to go back to church. And so he started going and then our family went ever since. So I look at my grandpa, and he was a good godly man. I look at my dad, and, and he lived a, a good Christian life. And then I look at where I'm at today. And I praise the Lord, I've got those generations. Some of you don't have that. I, I wish you did. I wish everybody had that kind of heritage, lineage. And if you have that tonight, please don't ever take that for granted. But I looked at my grandpa Stone, and I looked at the life that he lived. Very godly, very set apart, had a real walk with the Lord. My dad was a good man, a good Christian man, and is a good Christian man. But my dad... If I was to be honest, and he'd be honest and tell you that his Christianity probably was not as intense as my grandpa's Christianity. And I look at my life and I ask myself, is my Christianity as intense as my grandfather's Christianity? And I have to tell you, there are days when I say no. No, sadly, I'd have to tell you no. When I know of the, the knowledge that my grandfather had of the word of God and the prayer life that he had, and the intensity in which he lived and the consistency in which he lived his Christian life, I would have to ashamedly tell you that I am probably not uh, measuring up to some of the things of my grandfather in my life. Now, I'm going to change that. I'm working towards that. I want to be the Christian or even a greater Christian than my father and grandfather were. I should be. I should be aiming for that. And young people, I would encourage you tonight. If some of you are first generation Christians. You're, your family's not saved. You're starting and someday somebody is going to look back to you. What will they say of your Christian life? Someday, this is hard to believe, but someday you're going to be grandparents. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But you're going to be the grandmother. And some grandchild's going to look back and say, my grandma, and you can fill in the blank, or my grandpa was this type of Christian. 
I hope and they'll say that he was a godly man. They were godly people and they loved the Lord and we went to church and they knew the word of God. And man, they had a prayer life that would rattle the windows of heaven. You're the starting point. Some of you, on the other hand, are those grandparents today. Some of you have already raised your families and now it's your grandchildren that you're taking to church and your grandchildren that you're instructing. And I hope that your grandchildren will say, my grandpa, my opa, my granddad, whatever term you use, is a godly man. I hope that's what they'd say. But I wonder tonight if there aren't some things that we allow into our lives that dwindle away or take away from or chisel away some of those things in our lives. I have to tell you that there is a growing gap in each generation that I see of Christianity. When I go back to those times of my grandparents and see what Christianity was compared to the generation of my parents to the generation of today, I've got to tell you there's a gap that's widening between those generations. When I look at Christianity as a whole, I see a huge difference today. Huge difference. Now, it troubles me because my grandpa used the King James Version Bible back in that generation of uh, 80 years ago. Generations 40 years, so I'd, I've already got a generation, my dad's a generation, 40 years ago, and now that next generation, so three, four generations, my, my grandpa used the King James Bible, he went to a church that had a solid oak pulpit, he had a preacher that rear back and give it to him when they needed it, and love him when they needed it, uh, but there was a difference in Christianity. How many of you remember back 60, 70 years ago of what Christianity was? Anybody remember that? Maybe your grandparents, a few of you. How many of you remember back 40 years to what Christianity was? How many of you remember that? All right. How many of you would agree tonight that there's a difference between what we know Christianity was 80 years ago and what Christianity was 40 years ago? How many of you say there's a, a, a difference that you can see? Would you hold your hand up tonight? All right. Most of us, I think, would agree that. Now, some of you kids would say, well, this is Christianity. This is all I know. And, and I hope that what you're seeing is going to so impress you that you're going to say, hey, the Christianity I knew, the preacher I knew, the church I knew, the church people I knew, man, those people were solid Christians that love the Lord and, and did great things for God. I hope that's what we'll give to them. But sadly, I look back and I say, man, what was 80 years ago, and I wasn't there 80 years ago. I'm only going on the testimony of my grandparents. I'm only going on what I saw in their lives and the lives of those in that generation. I look at a man like Walt Harvey. Walt's 80, is he 80 years old? 80 years old. And Chuck just shared this with me tonight. And I'll, I'll say this because they're not here, and I'd say it if he was here. Walt Harvey's old school. Amen? He's old school. I love Walt Harvey. Walt Harvey's just broken his leg. He, he uh, fell out here the other night or whatever. I told him, by the way, I said, hey, why don't you sue the church for about $8 million, give us five and keep three. And uh, so they, they thought about that, and they said, well, Leslie's already got the $3 million spent, Pastor. So, um, so we're not going to do that. But uh, he, he's, he goes to the hospital, 80-year-old man. He has rods put in his legs and stabilizers and all kinds of things. He's laying in the hospital. He's only been there a few days. He's, he's in intense pain. The man next to him is going to have surgery. The family comes in to meet with him, and Walt says, Hey, can I pray with your family before you go into surgery? That's awesome. That's awesome. He says to me, I go over to visit him. I say, Hey, Walt, how you doing? I'm doing good, Pastor. I said, You in a lot of pain? Oh, yeah, it's killing me. I said, You taking any pain medication? No, I'm not taking that, he says. <laughs> I said to the guys in prayer, I said, I think he's afraid of getting addicted. I said, when you're 80 years old, who cares if you're addicted? You know, go ahead and do it. But uh, he says, I'm not doing that. He says, Pastor, now, here's some things that we got to get done. <laughs> I'm there to visit him and trying to encourage him. Now, there's a nursing home on Tuesday. Who's doing that? Who's got that? And, and the prime time. Now, prime time's going to eat uh, at the Mandarin, and, and I've got that set up. Now, Pastor, if you can make some, he's giving me this whole list of things i got to do. He's not laying there saying, oh my, oh my. I go into the hospital room to see the guy after just a few days of have, having surgery, a major surgery. He's got his Bible open. He's got a magnifying glass that looked like a TV screen. He's got... <laughs> but he's reading his Bible. He's not watching TV. He's not got something plugged in. He's reading the Word of God. I mean, he's real. I like that. that that's that generation. He's the guy that, that, you know, is always looking for something to do. He's there every Tuesday night doing general. He's always looking for something to do. I like that. That's, that's that generation. Now, then there's that next generation that, by the grace of God, some great things have happened. Many of our churches were started in that generation. Uh, this church was started in that generation. And I praise the Lord for that. And there was a lot of things done, but, but it was a little different. 
The Christianity that my grandpa Stone spoke of was one of extreme dedication and separation. You knew who the Christians were. I mean, they toted the line. They, they looked the part. They sounded the part. They did the things that Christians did. Intense study of the word of God. Whenever I went to my grandpa Stone's, he was either doing one of three things. He was either asleep on the couch, which was a good part of the time, or he was either studying the word of God or he was listening to something about the word of God. He had an old reel-to-reel uh, tape player. You kids would have no idea what that is, but an old reel-to-reel. And he'd be listening to men like J. Frank Norris and G. Uh, Vich, uh, G uh, uh, Vic, Beecham Vic, thank you, G. Beecham Vic, and um, he'd be listening to him, uh, he'd be listening to uh, great preachers of the Word of God, studying the Word of God, or he'd be out working in his garden. He grew flowers, and that was his uh, getaway. He also did some great woodworking, had a great woodworking ability. And so those were the things he was doing. I never caught my grandpa just doing worldly things. I never heard my grandpa swear. I never heard my grandpa uh, uh, use things that Christians ought not to do or say. I never saw those things. It was just great. My grandma Stone was a saintly woman. My grandma Stone's job was to raise nine children. She had ten. One passed away. She raised nine children. Uh, she raised them in a day of depression and some of those hard times. Uh, she was a, a wife. She was a mother. She was a tremendous cook. That woman can make pie like nobody made pie. Uh, when you went to her house, you'd say, oh, Grandma, have you got any elderberry pie? That was, that was my favorite that she made. I never had it anywhere else but there. And she, oh, man, she can make elderberry pie. And I'd say, oh, man, have you got any elderberry pie, Grandma? She'd say, there's one in the freezer. Go get it, and I'll warm it up. And so I'd go down there. There'd be about 100 pies in that freezer. It was like I died and gone to heaven. It was awesome. She had peach pie and pear pie and she had raspberry pie and apple pie and cherry pie and oh man, you name it, she had. If it was fruit, it was in a pie. It was awesome. And she would call you over and she was just a tiny little woman and she'd call you over and she'd, she'd say, now come here, honey, and she'd just hug on you a little bit. And, and she, just, she just had that kind of love about her. And you, she would pray. If Grandpa wasn't there at the table, I'd go over, cut their grass or whatever, and she, she'd get lunch, you know. And she was one of those ladies. She could make bologna and fried eggs taste like a steak dinner. I mean, I don't know how they did it. They just had that knack. And she'd say, now let's pray. And she would pray. What a godly woman. I think of that generation. That, it was just different. Today, we see some changes the Christianity that I witnessed just 40 years ago seemed to be one of greater dedication and less distraction. It just seemed that they were going all the time. That Christianity was going. We've got to build a bus road. We've got to build a church. We've got to evangelize the world. That was the Christianity I knew. My church in Simcoe, Dr. Strachan, was just a man who desperately wanted to see revival. And I'll tell you, in our town of, of about 8,000 people, we were running high days of almost 1,000 people in church. In a city of 8,000, 10,000 people. An amazing day. Buses everywhere, people everywhere, kids everywhere. And people were running like crazy. And it seemed that there was an attention paid to the ministry that we just don't even see today. And we've got some great things. I want to tell you, I, I love our church. I think our church is on board. I think our church is heading in the right direction. We've got some great things going on. But as I look at Christianity as a whole, and I have to include us in that, I see some things in this generation that, Kind of bother me. As I look at what Christianity has become today, I have to sadly tell you that in a greater degree, Christianity has declined into a minute made worship. A minute made worship. We want it. We want it now. We want to get out of here because we've got other things to do. I kid with you. I said, we're going to get uh, out of here a little earlier this morning. And, you know, you can hear people, you know, amen and kind of chuckle a little bit. And, and, and I understand that. Time is valuable. And nobody wants to sit on a pew for an hour. I understand that. Back in the day, in my grandpa's day, they didn't have air conditioning. And they didn't have padded pews. And they didn't have all the things that we have today. You went to church, and a lot of times, the whole day was filled with church. They'd go to church early in the morning, and they would stay for lunch, and they would have a service in the afternoon because the, the people were working. They were farmers. They'd milk the cattle. Uh, then they'd come to church, and they couldn't come back for an evening service because to travel and do those things and take care of the farm it was just difficult. So they'd have most of the time spent there in the day. You got dressed up and you went to church and you behaved in church and kids didn't run in church. And, and when they came into the service, they would come into the auditorium and sit down and they would begin to pray. There was no talking in the service. There was no talking in the pre-service. You didn't, you didn't stand in the foyer and, and laugh and carry on. You came in and you sat down and you prayed and got ready for the worship. Now, I'm, I have nothing wrong with talking in the foyer and getting before the service. I like that. There's an excitement about that. 
But I do think we miss out a little bit on maybe the consecration that they had saying, God, we're coming into your holy service and we want to prepare ourselves and we want to get our hearts and minds in tune with what the preacher's going to give us. I think we do miss that. And so there have been some changes. I think today we have a drive through prayer time. Man, I got to, I got to, man, whew, it's at that time, I got to get to work, man. I got to get in that car and drive 20 minutes to work, and then I got to get to work, and I got to go, 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 go. And, and we've got all these modern conveniences that simply allow us to do more work in less time. And we get all done the day, and we go home, and man, our minds are exhausted. It was a day when our bodies were exhausted, now our minds are exhausted. I don't know if you experience that in your work. I, I don't do a lot of physical labor, but man, I go home, and my mind is like mush. I was telling somebody this morning that when I go home, a lot of times I'll turn on the TV and I'll just I'll watch the news or I'll watch something before supper because I just want someone to think for me for a while. I don't want to think about anything. And so we'll go through that. And so our minds are mush and we go through and we have supper and maybe watch a little bit of television and do some things around the house or whatever you got to do. And then you get ready for bedtime and you're so exhausted as soon as you hit the bed, you're falling asleep. And pretty soon prayer time is gone. Now, there was a day when men got up and before they milked the cows at five in the morning to get up and have a prayer time, a devotion time. And women would be there getting the breakfast ready for the man who was going out to do that work. And she'd pray along with him and the kids would come along and pray. And there was a family prayer time. There was a time when families used to sit around the table at night and talk and pray. How many of you remember those times? Hmm. Notice none of our teenagers are raising their hands. We don't do that anymore. Let's be honest. In our home, man, my kids are coming and going, and if we can sit down. We went out today for lunch and had a meal together. That's one of the first times in a few weeks that our families actually sat down and had a meal together on Sunday. We, we just have so much going on today. I tell you, I, I'm excited about what we've got going, but I'm, I'm missing those things. When I was a kid, meal time, you didn't answer the phone. You didn't go to your buddy's house. You went home. When my mom came out the back door and said, supper, man, you ran home. Now, the difference is, we were out. <laughs> we weren't in the basement, amen? We weren't down in the cave doing this. We were outside. We used to play games like hide and seek. Yeah, what's that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll show you sometime. <laughs> we do it with the offering every Sunday here. <laughs> hide and seek. We used to play Red Rover, Red Rover. We used to play go to your buddy's house and Play hockey on the street or something. You know, we, we, she'd yell, stop her, and you went home, and everybody went home. All the kids would scatter and go home for supper, and you sat down, and Dad would say, what would you learn in school today? Well, we learned about math. What would you learn in math? We talked about that, and how's so-and-so doing? And Mom would say, how was your day? Dad and Dad would say, oh, it was a good day. I worked hard, did this, and we sat around. We actually talked to each other with our mouths. We didn't sit at the table like some people do and text and say, how was your day? And the other person at the other end of the table says, it was pretty good. How was yours? That, I've seen people do that. I've seen people at the same table texting each other. Unbelievable. We are in a coloring book Bible time. Well, I don't want something that's hard to read. I don't want something I've got to dig into. I don't want something that's going to make me think a little bit. I want a coloring book where I can just color in the pictures, and it's got lots of pictures, and I don't, I don't have to worry about the words. I've learned that in this generation, and I've been working with our, our staff on this, our design staff, you'll notice that we're trying to make some changes. Even in your bulletin day, you'll notice that we've got a number of pictures in the bulletin. We're a picture generation. We want to see a picture. We, we understand by a picture. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, mean, I understand that a picture says a lot of words, and, and we've become a fewer words in this generation. But in our Christianity, we still need to have the Bible now, I, I'm going to try something in the next few weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to move up to the next generation. I got that iPad from the church, and I absolutely love that thing. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that thing. Uh, it has become a great tool for me already. I'm going to try using that to preach from in the next few weeks. I, I've been writing down on paper all these, all these notes all these years, and uh, I can put it on there. I can see it better. It's nice and bright, but I'll tell you what. I'm going to use my Bible uh, there are some guys that, that read the Bible from that, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're in a modern age, and, and I understand that, and it's still the Word of God. But I don't know. I just like to feel the leather, don't you? I like to feel those pages. I like to see the written Word of God. I don't know what it is, but I, I'll, I don't think I'll, I shouldn't say never, but I don't think I'll ever leave just using the Bible. So I'll have my notes there. It might be electronic. But I want the Word of God that I can hold. I want to hold it up, show people. I want people to see it. I want the Word of God. And then today, I feel like Christianity has declined into a sensual, 
materialistic, rebellious, self-centered Christianity. Now, that's harsh, but that's the truth. And if you don't think so, you take a look at Christianity today on the broader sense. It may not be all Bible Baptist Church, but on a broad brush, that is much of Christianity today. Why? Why? What is it that's contributed to the decline of our Christianity? What made this generation of my grandparents different than the generation of my parents, and more so, this generation that we live right now. What's the difference? I believe wholeheartedly that two things have contributed to the decline of Christianity, the breakup of our homes, and the rising problems of our society. What we watch and what we listen to. Now you think about that. My grandparents didn't have a television to the last part of their lives. And they did, it was a little black and white one that you had to turn the channel. There was no remote control. They had nine remote controls. All their kids, turn the channel. You turn it, turn the channel. Some of you remember that. Some of you remember you didn't have a satellite dish. You didn't have cable. We didn't, they didn't know about that stuff. If they had a TV, and it was rare that they did, most of them had a radio. They'd listen to the radio. And what was on the radio? Preaching and the Lone Ranger. Some of you kids have no idea who the Lone Ranger was. Hi-ho, silver, and away. Some of you are getting flashbacks, aren't you? Kids are like, what? No, it was great. The shadow knows. <laughs> you say, preacher, how do you know those things? I'm old, that's how. I remember some of those. I remember them talking about those things. I remember listening to some of those things. But they had a little black and white TV. If you, if you wanted to get clear reception on the four channels that you maybe got... You had to go out and you had to move the TV antenna. How many of you remember reaching out a window and turning? Yeah, see, a bunch of old people in here. You had to reach out. The kids envision this now. It's 30 below zero. Your dad says, turn the TV antenna. Now, antenna is a big metal. I, I can't believe i got to explain this. Big metal pole, and it had a, a, it was called a head on top. It was kind of a triangle. And then you had to point that in the right direction to get a TV signal. And so it was the kid's job because mom and dad didn't do that. You had to reach out the window and there was a little handle. You had to move that thing around until the picture came in clear. And you'd get it just right and dad say, stop! And you'd hold it right there and then it'd go all snowy again. Then you had to readjust it. Remember that? And then my parents in the 60s and 70s had the onset of television. Color TV. Remote controls. Oh yeah. My dad sold TVs. I was, I was one of those kids, when a new TV came out, my dad was usually one of the first guys that could get it if he could afford it, and so he'd bring those home. We had some nice TVs in my day. One of the funnest things we had was when, in that day, TVs didn't sit on a table, they were in a cabinet. They'd be like in a, like this table would, would be, have a top on it, and then the t tube would be down here and sides on it. Well, my dad would bring those homes after the picture tubes went in them, and we would play in those. We'd pretend we were on TV. So I've been on TV since I was about seven years old. Those are good times. But man, I, my, my parents' generation began to get glued to the television. Now we could get more pictures and more uh, things, and they became more elaborate. And today, man, we've got 60-inch plasma TVs with HD, and it means you feel like you're sitting right there. And we began to watch it. We began to become more and more controlled by that thing. And then what we listen to. Back in my grandpa and grandma's day, they listened to symphonic music. They would listen to maybe, maybe some orchestrated music and maybe a little bit of some of the bands of that day. But even then, that was, that was ungodly music. Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, those were dance bands. And dancing was sin. And they were done in halls where there was drinking, and that was sin. So you didn't have anything to do with that. My parents grew up going to the sock hop at high school. And they went to dances. They told me they loved to dance. They went to the dances, and everybody danced. And, man, it was Chuck Berry and, and uh, dance, or, uh, Rock Around the Clock. And it was The Temptations and Motown and all of those things. And, and, and that generation became consumed with that, the, the happy days era. But there wasn't much place for Christianity. 
My parents, grandparents lived in a day where if you liked a girl or a boy, you went to their house. A girl would stay in her home, and the boy would go to her home, and he would sit in the parlor. How many of you remember the parlor? You'd sit in the parlor, and you would court that young lady. You would sit there with her parents, and they would talk to you, and you would talk with them. You'd maybe play a board game or so, and then when it got to be about 7, 8 o'clock when it was getting dark, you went home. You didn't stay till 1, 2 in the morning. You didn't stay doing those other things. You went home. And then my parents' generation, they started to date in the car. And you would go for a drive. And you'd go up to Blueberry Hill. You don't know why they're laughing, do you? I found my thrill. Boom, 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 boom. (laughs) How do you know that, Pastor? I'm old. (laughs) What was that? Well, young people started driving, and then they went up by the lake, or they got away, and they went necking in the car. And that generation changed. And Saturday night was now for dancing and for partying and going out, and church was too early in the morning. And things changed. And then we get into my generation, the 70s. One of the messiest, craziest times, I think, that we've ever known. We watch things as a Christian today that my grandparents would never have watched or dreamed available to watch. We put into our ears music planted in the 40s, cultivated in the 50s, watered in the 60s, and sprayed with toxins of sin in the 70s. And Christians plug into their ears from that time forward things that Christians would never have dreamed listened to in times before. You want to know why I preach with extreme caution about going to movie theaters and having videos above a G or PG rating? You want to know why some of the nonsense on Facebook and other network sites are being preached over the pulpit? Do you want to know why music outside the realm of godly Christian music is preached against in our church? You want to know why this preacher says, don't listen to that stinking rock music of the day. Don't listen to the artists of today. Don't watch those things of the day. You want to know why I preach against those things? Because I want the Christianity that was back here. I want my grandparents' Christianity. I want us to be godly. I want us to be Christ-centered. I want us to be living a victorious Christian life. I want those things, and I know that what's brought the gap between this generation and this generation are those very things that we have put into our mind through our eyes and through our ears. I'm going to preach hard against those things. I'm going to beg you young people not to listen to some of these modern-day artists and modern-day music. I'm going to beg you not to watch some of the things that you watch on television and accept. Now, I've got to tell you this. It's not their fault because they're not in control of those things. We are. We allow them to listen to them. And some of them have been introduced to some of those things by the things that their parents listen to and watch. And some of them have maybe picked up on some of those things because they've been with other Christians and heard other Christians talk about or go with or be involved in some of those things that have the wrong connotation or the wrong spiritual application and think, well, they're good godly people and they watch it, so it must be all right. Please be careful what you put on your TV when kids come over to your house. Please be careful what music you pass on to other people. Please be careful of those things in your life that would maybe influence someone else away from the things of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? That has brought Christianity to the level of this ungodly world. What we watch and listen to was sin and was evil just 80 years ago. That's not a long time. That's, as I've mentioned, Mr. Harvey's lifetime. That's other people in our church's lifetime. I'll not point them out, but there are some folks in our church that are in that age group. And they look back and they would tell you, they would say tonight, amen, preacher, you preach it. We remember those times. And even some of those have fallen into the trap of the things of this day. When television lowered its standard from family to personal, and when music was allowed to feed the desires of the flesh, the world changed, and sadly, Christians went right down the stream with it. Christians did fight it at first, but they grow weary of the fight, and they gave in. You remember, and I'll talk about this again, remember, some of you are a little bit older, remember when those first television programs came out? Remember Ozzie uh, Ozzie and Harriet Nelson? Remember that? 
Remember that? that? That was an old, old show. That was one of the first shows that came out on television back in the 50s, 60s. It was a family. Man, they went to church together. They, they had a loving relationship, and mom loved dad, and dad loved mom. And I mean, they were very discreet. Uh, if they ever showed, if they showed, if they ever showed the bedroom, the beds were separate. Mom had a bed, and dad had a bed. Now, I know that in most homes in that day, that was not the case. But for television, they separated because they never wanted people to get the idea that those people were sleeping together. Now, kids, can you imagine that today if a show came out and the man had one bed and a woman had the other bed? You think, that's crazy. But back then, that was the standard. Leave it to Beaver. Remember that? Can you tell I watch too much TV? Can you tell that? Man, great show. Gee, Wally. The beaver was this little kid, and he always got in trouble, and his older uh, uh, brother, Wally, was always trying to help him out. And their mom and dad, boy, they were strict, and boy, they had rules, and the kids would sometimes try to get around that, and the kids would always end up coming and saying, Mom and Dad, we're sorry we did wrong. Do you notice that in today's television, the parents are always wrong, and the kids are coming to get their apology? Ever notice that? I, I noticed that one time I was watching a show, uh, Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Had three boys, and the boys were always coming, and the dad was always apologizing for saying the wrong things or doing the wrong things. And he had apologized to the kids. Crazy. Crazy. Christians did fight it, but we've given up that fight. We've given up. The draw of the flesh is not towards the godly. And so today, we have a generation that is not what Christianity once was. Let me show you, first of all, tonight, what we see affects our sentiments. Would you turn with me now to Lamentations chapter 3? Now I've given you a long introduction to give you this. Lamentations chapter 3. Now I'm going to get you to read this with me. Let's do this. Let's all stand together if you would. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 51. Let's read it. Here we go. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. Because of all the daughters of my city. Let's read it again. Lamentations 3.51. I, I must have given you the wrong verse. 51. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. There we go. Because of all the daughters of my city. Thank you. You can be seated. I want you to underline. I want you to notice, if you will, mine eye affecteth mine heart. Just that first, that first phrase. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. What is it then that we are seeing today as Christians that affect our hearts in such a way that we are not the Christians that we ought to be? Now tonight, I, again, I'm going to ask you to be honest. I'm not going to get you to vocalize this, but in your heart of hearts, would you tonight look at your Christianity and maybe measure it against those other generations and ask yourself, am I more of the Christian that my grandparents were? I mean, if they were Christians, I mean, saved, knew the Lord, Love the word of God. Are you more of that or less of that? Maybe your parents. Maybe tonight, young people, you look at your parents. They're the first generation Christians, and you will look at their lives and say, man, my mom and dad love the Lord, and man, they've got some great things in their lives. Am I more of what my parents are, or am I a little bit less of what my parents are? Your parents have to get after you about what you're trying to watch when they're not looking. Do they have to get after you because of the things that you're listening to that you ought not be listening to? Or are you saying, hey, listen, I've made that stand, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live even greater lives than my parents. What is it? Now, I want to tell you tonight, the Canadians watch an average of 22.7 hours a week, a week of television. 22 hours a week, that's 3.25 hours a day. Three and a quarter hours, three hours and 15 minutes of television a day. Now, I think that's a little low myself. I think that's low. I think most people get home around 6 o'clock, and they turn the television on and watch the news. Maybe they get home before that. Teenagers get home before that. TV goes on. And most people are watching TV till 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Some are watching beyond that. Could I beg you? To turn your TV off, especially on Saturday nights at 11 or 12 o'clock, so that you can go to bed and get a good night's sleep? Would you do that for me so when you come to church, you're wide-eyed and ready to receive the Word of God rather than this? Man, I, I don't know why some people come to church. They don't hear anything but turning your songbooks and amen, have a great day. That's all they hear. 
Man, get, get awake for the word of God. This is important. This is the most important thing of our lives. Once a week, let's go to bed, let's get refreshed, and let's get up in the morning ready to receive the word of God. You say, well, preacher, I can stay up till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, watching TV or playing video games and come to church. Yeah, I know, I see you. Like this. <laughs> come on, I know. You get in a warm building in a comfortable pew and stay up too late on Saturday night. Boy, you're not getting a lot of preaching. We ought to come say, man, I need the preaching of the word of God. This is the one time when we come and worship God, and we need to set that apart. Young people, go to bed. And parents, tell them to go to bed. Turn that thing off. We're going to bed it's Saturday night. Children, ages 2 to 11, watch 17.7 hours of television a week. 12 to 17-year-olds, 17.1 Men 18 to 20 or 18 plus watch 21.5 hours of television a week. Women 18 plus 26.8 hours of television. Now this is a study from back I think it was around 2000, so it's 11 years old. And I think those numbers are low. We're glued to that television set. We're watching that television set. We can't turn off that television set. How many of you have gone to someone's house to visit and the TV stayed on? It never shut off. Why do we do that? Why do we have that television set on? Why can't we turn it off? I've been to people's homes and the TV's blasting and I'm yelling over top of it. Now I want to tell you about Jesus. And the price is right. You know, I, oh. And I'll say, could, can I ask you, could you just turn that off? I, I, I can't concentrate on two different things. And really, if there's other noise in the background, I, I really can't concentrate. Could you just turn that thing off? And you know what they do? They don't turn it off. They turn the volume off. It drives me crazy. So the picture's still going, and I'm, I'm, I'm easily distracted. If anybody moves in this auditorium, you'll see me move. I, if anybody's moving, you know, if you're touching your nose or pick your hair, or, you know, I, I see it. And so I'm trying to tell them about Christ, and I'm, I'm, I'm like this. I see, I catch myself. I'm, I'm like a moth to a light. Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm addicted. In 2006, the motion picture theater industry recorded total operating revenues of about $1.2 billion. In 2006, up 2.4% from 2005. Two recent studies led by Rand Health Behavioral Science Rebecca Collins examined the impact of TV sex on teenagers. Now, I can't believe I'm even saying that word in the pulpit. I'm not talking about TV either. When I was a kid, you didn't say that three-letter word, S-E-X. I mean, we didn't say that as kids. You weren't allowed to. That was a bad word. Now, I'm saying it today because, let's face it, that's very open. These kids know exactly what that is. They understand what it is. They've been bombarded by it. They've talked about it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, but I, I want to use it discreetly, and please understand, I'm not comfortable doing it. Sex on teenagers, sexual beliefs and activities. The results supported the view that watching shows with sexual content may influence teen sexual behavior, but also found that some viewing effects can be positive because it allows people to talk about it. But I don't hear a lot of parents talking about those things with their kids today. Across all age groups, teens who saw the most sexual content were twice as likely to initiate intercourse within the next year as those who saw the least. Now, we've got great young people. They're awesome. These girls, I want to tell you, I love you girls. You're, you're beautiful. You keep yourselves. For, for the better part that I see you, you're modest. You try to keep yourselves chaste and wholesome looking. Praise God for that. Thank your parents for that. I appreciate that. If your parents are here, God bless you. I want to protect them. I have my, one of my daughters is sitting here. One's in the nursery. I want to protect that little girl. Uh, they have often complained that I'm, I am more strict and uh, observant of what they are doing than my son. Now, I'm going to be honest. It's different with a son. I've told my son, her dad is going to be watching you. <laughs> her dad's going to keep an eye, and I'm going to keep an eye too. Don't you think I just let my son run uh, willy-nilly around here? I don't do that. I, I'm watching what he does. I know what he does. I know where he's going for the better part. And I think we ought to. You say, well, I'm, I'm 16 years old. Exactly, exactly. You do not know what you're doing. You do not have control of yourself. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because I was 16 once too. 
And I was the pace car of racing hormones. Amen. So I'm going to protect her. I'm going to watch over her. And we have guys from our church, they come over, and, and we're glad to have them. We want to come to our home, want to have fellowship, but I'll tell you what, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Leave the door open. Sit in the other chair. Go home at a decent hour. Now, some of these guys have learned that. Someone came over, and I said, boys, it's 10 o'clock. We know. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get over here? We rode our bikes. I said, well, get a light. Get home. <laughs> I love them. I love them. They're great guys. But you know what? I'm going to try and protect them. I'm not going to let my girls go out alone with some guy and say that I trust them. I don't. I trust my daughter. I trust you, honey. I don't trust you. <laughs> and if you do, you're crazy. But they're good Christian boys. Yes, they are, with blood running through their veins. And the same sin nature in them that is in us. I watch my wife. And I watch men around her. You say, Pastor, why would you do that? Because I've watched enough television in my day to know that in our minds constantly, sexual things, sexual things, sexual things, advertisements, pictures, innuendos, situations, over and over and over and over again. And for those that are maybe a little bit older, you say, well, preacher, we're not seeing those things. No, because your generation had enough character to say, we're getting rid of that. We're not going to have it. We're going to turn it off. I asked the Harvey the other day, because I was thinking about this message. I asked him, I said, now, Mr. and Mrs. Harvey, would you have ever seen on your television in your day any of the stuff that you see today that comes on television? Oh, no, Pastor. No, we wouldn't have seen that. What would you have done if you'd seen it? We'd have, th we'd have turned that thing off or thrown it in the garbage. But yet, even that generation today has before them all the time the little wooden box that the early inventors heard people say, no one will ever sit in their living room for hours and watch a pine box. 26.8 hours, 21.5 hours, 17.1 hours, 17.7 hours a week, 3.25 hours a day, people watch TV. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. Would you say that with me? Mine eye affecteth mine heart. You know what that means? It means that what I see influences my heart, influences what I think, influences what I believe. And what are we putting before our eyes today? What are we, what are we watching today? We're watching programs that are full of filth. We're watching programs that are full of sin. We're watching programs that our grandparents would have shuddered to watch or even think about or hear. Most of us have seen two men kissing on TV. Most of us have seen a man and a woman sleeping together on TV. Most of us have seen some uh, scanty clad woman on TV. And we embrace it and accept it. We don't change the channel anymore. We don't get upset and throw that thing away. I remember a day when preachers would get up and say, we need to get rid of our TVs. And Man, everybody brought their TV and threw their TV in a pile and smashed it. And about three weeks later, they went out and got another one. Because we love TV. I'm going to be honest with you, I love TV. I grew up on it. I mean, it was, one, it was a babysitter for me somewhat. I mean, I love, I love to watch a good movie. I love old movies. I don't like the new junk. They don't even know how to make a movie anymore. Man, you had a good guy and a bad guy, and the good guy took care of the bad guy. That was, that was movies. You didn't have these things going around, but you know what? I've, I've even noticed in studying some of this stuff, when I look back to some of those movies of the 30s and 40s, those women weren't dressed very good. What were they called in the 30s, the, the uh, girls, the um, flappers, flappers? Short skirts, low cut, tight. They'd bebop around the men, saloon settings, drinking. It was there. But you know the difference was back then, preachers were preaching, Hollywood is sin! Hollywood is sin! Don't have that! Don't watch it! Don't be involved in it! And Christians wouldn't do it. But you don't hear a lot of preaching against TV today, do you? You know why? Because most preachers are addicted to it. Most preachers are watching in their home. Most preachers are allowing it to come in. And I'll tell you what, it's a constant battle and fight. And if you don't fight, it will win. Mine eyes affect with mine heart. You cannot hardly watch a show that does not have adultery. They all have some man running around with some other woman and we've be become accustomed to it and we think it's almost part of society and so that we can accept it. And when somebody falls into adultery, they say, oh man, that's terrible. But we go on. 
I mean, there was a day when if a man was caught fooling around on his wife, it was a shame and it was a reproach. And if he didn't get right, the church put him out. And today we say, well, you know, it's going to happen. And, you know, it's part of the day. No, no. You can hardly watch a TV show today that doesn't have a man that looks like an idiot. It's true. You look at some of the main shows, some of the comedy shows, and the guy's always an idiot. His wife's the genius, and the man's the idiot. His kids are the geniuses, and he's the idiot. Now, i got to admit to you, there are a lot of guys that are idiots. <laughs> and there are a lot of guys I look at their lives, and I think, man, you, you, what are you doing? And maybe they are depicting who we are better than we'd like to admit. But I'd like to think that the husband could, should be the head of the home and be right with God and walk with God and, and be a godly example. And his wife would look at that and, and revere that in and, and not a, a weird sense, but say, man, my, my husband walks with God. And because of that, I feel secure and I feel safe and I feel that he's leading us in a path that will take us to better things. But let's face it, there are a lot of men today in Christianity who are idiots. And they say, well, honey, let's just try this and we'll see what happens. And we'll throw care to the wind. And the poor wife is dragging the children behind as they fall deeper and deeper and deeper into the doldrums of life because a man doesn't know the word of God. And he doesn't pray. And he doesn't go to church. Carly, if you'd please, the sound effect. Thank you. Pretty quiet. Well, I, I'm going to get quiet too because I fall into that trap too. And it sickens me. I wonder why it is that materialism is a problem in our country. Our debt hinders us from doing what is good and right. I wonder why it is that young people are falling prey to sexual activity at 10, 11, 12 years of age. I wonder why it is that drugs and alcohol and pornography are raging. I wonder why it is. Number of 30 second TV commercials seen in a year by an average child, 20,000. 20,000. These aren't my numbers. These are coming from Nielsen's ratings and other sources like that. Number of TV commercials seen by an average person by age 65, Two million. And what are those commercials saying? You gotta have. Nikki, Christmas is coming up. And Nikki, you have got to have the new iPad too. And you've got to have the new computer. And you've got to have the new phone. You've got to have the phone. You know, imagine some of you older people asking your parents for a phone when you were 10 or 12 years of age. Can you imagine carrying that rotary phone around with you and, <laughs> hello, hello. We had them, we call them telephone booths. You had to put in a dime or then a quarter and you, then you called your parents. Or you ran like 90 to get home. You didn't call and say, oh, we're gonna be a little late because we're at the mall. You didn't do that. You got home in a certain hour. If you broke down, you put the hood up and you waved someone down, you didn't call 911. I know we're in a different day. And there's some good things about those things. I, I, I like knowing where my kids are. I like having them available to me. I understand that. But man, some of these kids, they've got to have it. If I don't get that phone, I'm just going to die. They've got the new Samsung, or they've got the iPhone, or they, and all i got is this flip phone. You know what I'd love to have when I was a kid? Any kind of thing that would flip. Flip phone. Oh. Huh. You've got to have the new exciting car. You've got to have OnStar. You've got to have, and we buy into that. And we say, oh man, a 60 inch, oh honey, we've got to have a 60 inch plasma TV. There's nothing wrong with 60 inch plasma TVs and if you can afford it and you want to get one and you can control it, go ahead. But here's the problem, most people can't. They say, well, we'll just put it on the plastic card and we'll pay for it later. And then they don't. And then they get in debt and they do it over and over and over. And man, I got to get this and I got to get that. Man, I got to buy, 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 buy because I got to have because the neighbors have it. He got a new truck. I got to have a new truck. They got a new TV. I got to have a TV. Whatever happened to contentment? Can I tell you that my grandpa and grandma had the same furniture for about 70 years? They would recover it. Remember those days? 
you would have someone sew something that would fit over your couch, or you would take in the old cushions and they would put new fabric around it. Now today, it's more expensive to do that, but the idea is they were satisfied with what they had. And today we've got to, hey, this is a year old. i got to have a new one. This is a year old. Oh, my goodness. Hand-me-downs. Some of you used to wear those, remember? Which you, which you dreaded to wear pants that had a tear in it or had a patch on it. Today are $100. Kids pay 100 bucks to wear the clothes that we were scared to wear to school that people would laugh at us. Oh. Percentage of survey participants in 1993 who said that TV commercials aimed at children make them too materialistic. 92%. We know it. Parents, you know it. You know that watching that TV and your kids seeing that stuff, you've got to have, you've got to have, you've got to have. The bigger, the better. Uh, you're, you're not cool unless. Oh, man, and I'm not even going to go off tonight on the drinking commercials. Oh, man, you got to be part of the hip-hop happening scene, man. you got to have the chicks, and you got to, oh, yeah. I, I could never do it, but anyways, <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah, I mean, you got to have the tall, cold one and have all the girls around you. Oh, yeah. Boop, 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 boop. And our society's bought into that. I played hockey the other night. I'm sitting in the, the dressing room. And one of the guys is drinking before the game. I just, sit, I just shake my head. I just think, oh my goodness, how dumb are you? You're going to go out on that ice, having drank, losing some comprehension of what you're doing. But you could get hurt. And so we get done the game, and the guy says, man, I didn't know we had the Lord on our team. He looks down at me, because they know I'm a preacher, because I tell them I'm not ashamed of it. I'm a preacher. He says, oh, preacher, uh, we got the, 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 the Lord on our team. And I said, yeah, and you ought to know what the Lord thinks about drinking. He says, well, the Lord knows I drink. I said, yeah, we all do. We all do. <laughs> we buy into it. One guy said this, well, it really is Canadian. <laughs> drinking beer is Canadian. Dr drinking, drinking your mind drunk and oblivious is Canadian. Boy, that's a great thing I want to raise up the flagpole. I thought Canadian was being a peace-loving nation and a nation that worked hard and a nation that, that was founded on the things of God. I thought that was Canadian, but that's changed. We're just a bunch of beer-drinking slobs. Great testimony. And you know what? The world knows it. I travel parts of the world, and people say, oh, Canadian, you guys like beer. I said, not me. I hate it. It's filthy liquor. It's a devil's drink. Oh, one of those Canadians. <laughs> Saskatchewan? <laughs> we don't have anybody here from Saskatchewan, do we? Because <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> Mine eye affecteth my heart. And when I see those commercials, 92% of the people said it makes us materialistic, but we keep showing it over and over again. And it's on hour after hour after hour, and our kids sit in front of it, and we feed it to them and feed it to them and feed it to them. Let me ask you tonight, Brother Russell, would you ever let me come into your home and cuss in front of your children? Say, hey, boys, I want to teach you some words. Blankety, blank, blank, blank. Would you let me do that? Mrs. Runhair, could I ever uh, take your girls, I'll come over to your house and say, hey girls, um, I'm going to take you downstairs and, and I'm going to show you how to drink beer. And I'll pop someone, and you'd let me do that, wouldn't you? No. How, any parents here that would say, hey, I'd let my kids watch a man and a woman make love? I'd, I'd let them do that. I'd bring them over to my house and we'll have them right here in the front room and say, okay, go ahead and make love for us. You'd never dream of doing that. But don't we do that every time we hit that button, and allow that thing to come on in front of our eyes, and they're drinking on there, and we let them do it there. It's in your home. And you listen to those cuss words, it's in your home. And you go to the store. We used to go to the store. You don't do that anymore. You used to go to the store and rent them and bring them in our home, and we set our kids down and say, kids, we're going to watch this movie. And before their eyes, you blankety blank, fool around and have an intermarital relationship, and, and we let some scantily girl stand in front of our boy and entice him on a screen. I don't know why we're not like my grandparents. They didn't have that. They didn't want that. 
They didn't need that. My parents' generation said, we kind of like that. Kind of like some of that stuff. Now, we're going to be careful, and I mean, there's going to be some censorship. I remember when a show by the name of All in the Family came out. Remember that? My preacher preached against that. Oh, my Carol O'Connor. And, and, and the people on that show, you kids won't remember, it was a, a family from New York, and it was a dad who was a racist. He was, you talk about politically incorrect. Whew. He made fun of black people. He made fun of Jews. He made fun of, of hippies. I mean, he made fun of everybody. And, and he did it openly. And I mean, everybody laughed. Ha ha, great show. My preacher, don't you watch that show? My parents thought it was funny. And that generation loved it and became very popular. And then comes my generation. Saturday Night Live. I remember as a kid, my preacher preaching against that, but I'd stay up late on Saturday night to watch it. And I thought it was funny. And I didn't realize that some of the things they were saying were innuendos. And I, you know, later on catch that what they were saying was off color, but the other stuff was funny. And it became accepted. My eye affecteth my heart. If I was to play back for our church, which you played this week in your home, would you be embarrassed? I mean, if I had a little box that could take all the shows that you watched, okay, tonight we're going to go to, I won't pick anybody. Let this, this, you put it in your mind tonight. We're going to go to the Stones' home tonight and watch what they watched. Would I be embarrassed? I would be. I would be, because some of you think, I, why didn't our pastor turn that fast enough? Why didn't they get that off of there? Why is that playing? I'm not, I want you to understand, I, I do try to guard, I try to guard hard, but there are times when it just gets by you. And I think to myself, why do I even need it at all? If we played back tonight what you read or looked at on a computer screen this week, would you be embarrassed? I mean, the things that you thought you hide, the things that you thought nobody knew about, the things that you put on a screen, the things that you communicated to others. If I could bring that up tonight and put it on the screen and say, okay, now we're going to watch so-and-so. Here's what they had on their computer. Would you be embarrassed? I mean, if we can't put it before our church, should we put it before our eyes? Should we put it before our children? Oh, my. What if we... Put what you watched in the privacy of your home or on a theater screen this month. Would you be embarrassed at all? Honestly? If you wouldn't be, I hope it's because you didn't watch it. I hope it's not because you become so lulled to think, well, I didn't think it was bad. We have been lulled into a trance that makes us believe I can handle it. I can handle it. I can handle watching those images. I can handle listening to that language. I can handle that situation but we can't. Our nation is proof of that. Our Christianity is proof of that. Mine eye affects my heart. What and how much are you seeing and what effect do you think it is having on your heart? Do you run to the word of God and say, I've got to have the word of God as much as you have to watch that favorite TV program? Do you spend as much time watching those programs as you do the Word of God? Could you tell me tonight what our country would be if men spend 21.7 hours a week in the Word of God? Or women spend 28 hours a week in the Word of God? Or we spend 3.25 hours a day in the Word of God? Could I beg you tonight to spend 32 minutes in the Word of God? Or if we spend an hour in prayer, or if we spend 20 hours telling people about Christ, what would it be? We become so distracted today with the things of this life that we have left the things of God. My grandparents didn't have a television. They read the word of God. That was entertainment. Listening to a preacher on the radio was entertainment. Going to church was entertainment. Today we've got to go to football games and baseball games and wrestling events and all those other things. I wonder how many people tonight are out of church because there's some sport event going on in their lives. I am so sick of stinking sports. Oh my goodness become a curse upon Christianity, that we got to spend more time at an arena or a baseball park or a soccer stadium than the word of God in the house of God. We are what we see. I'll give you this and we'll close. The Family Conditions for Modeling Values for Children by David Pope No. I like that name. I wish it was no Pope, but it's Pope No. He's a Ph.D., He's a professor of sociology at Rutgers University. 
In a recent poll of adult Americans conducted by the Wall Street Journal, moral decline was stated to be the biggest problem that America will face in the next 20 years. <laughs> it's not even taking that long. And when asked what was the biggest change in America character has been since 1950s, the leading answer was less stable marriages and families. Deterioration of stable marriages and families has been a principal generator of moral decline. This is because children learn moral values mainly within their families and mainly by relying on their parents as role models. When families are unstable, when parents are absent, emotionally distant or preoccupied, or when parents themselves are immoral, the learning of moral values by children is greatly hindered. Could I say to you tonight that I believe that our children are not learning their moral values from their parents, they're learning them from a television set, and they're learning them from a radio, and they're learning them from a computer screen, and we can't understand why our kids are messed up, but we put in front of them for the 12, 14, 15, 18 years of their lives the immorality and corruption of this life, and we, by showing them, have condoned it. And then we want to know why Johnny and Sally want to go necking. We want to know why our kids are so materialistic. And we want to know why our husband isn't satisfied with his wife anymore. And we want to know why that wife isn't content with all the things she's got. Say this with me. Mine eye. Mine eye affecteth my heart. Let's say it together. Mine eye affecteth my heart. Let me ask you tonight. We're going to leave church here in a few minutes. What are you going to do? Well, some of us are going to get something to eat because we eat after church. And you're probably going to go to the restaurant that's got 12 TVs. <laughs> Can't escape it. And some of us are going to go home. And we're going to turn on TV. Could I say this, that in a whole, the medium of television is not a bad thing. What's on the television is what's wrong. How about today, tonight, dads? When we turn that TV on, we watch and say, mine eye affecteth my heart. Mine eye affecteth my heart. Oh, we're not watching that program. Mark down the programs you're watching. Mark them down. And see how many curse words are in it, and see how many homosexuals are in it, and see how many uh, adult situations are in it, and see how many sexual things are in it, and how many evil things are in it, and how many times they criticize somebody who's a fundamental Christian. See how many, mark it down. You'll be appalled. Here's something. Listen for the curse words. You know, I've had people give me videos. Hey, Pastor, watch this great video. And I, I watch the first five minutes. I, I shut it off and say, I, I can't watch that. It's got so many curse words in it. There's cursing in that? Yeah. I never noticed it. You know why? Because we become immune to it. Because we hear it all the time. Mine eye affecteth my heart. You want to know why I preach against those things? You want to know why I preach hard about this? Because of these guys. This is our hope. And they've already seen so many things in their lives that they will never forget. I wonder how they'll ever become what my grandparents were and what my parents were. And I hope maybe a little bit of what I am. And to my children tonight, I apologize for those things that I've allowed you to watch that I shouldn't have. I apologize for those things that I didn't hit that change button fast enough. I apologize for even considering that we'd watch some shows, even by their titles. And I apologize to our church tonight that I wasn't more of a man of God than I should have been. From this day forward, if I even watch that stupid thing, it's going to be very, very limited. We need to be careful. Why aren't we where we should be? Our hearts aren't right. And why aren't our hearts right? Because mine eyes affect my heart. Let's pray. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday 